A few minutes ago, I gave a long interview to Izvestia, which is a Russian um, media company. And while I cannot post the interview here, for obvious reasons, I can't scoop them, I would like to reiterate some of the points I've made in the interview, points which may not, may not make it into the public. <laughs> um, and so I was asked about the current conflict in, in Ukraine. Obviously, Russia calls this conflict a military operation, not an invasion, and not a war. Although, of course, it is both an invasion and a war. Russia is trying to give the impression that this is a limited operation with highly specific strategic goals, and yet it had kept these goals utterly obscure and enigmatic. I made a few points in the interview which I think um, not many people make, including not many experts. And perhaps my advantage is that I had lived in Russia in the late 1990s, and again, between 2016 and 2019, I teach in Russia, in Southern Federal University, in Rostov on Don. I know Russians well, 2 million out of Israel's population of 9 million are Russian immigrants. I grew up with them. I was honed and educated on Russian poetry, Russian literature, and what is widely known in Russia as the Russian soul. One should make a distinction between the people of Russia and the kleptocracy that had hijacked the Russian state and its institutions. Still, Russia is a geopolitical entity, and like every other geopolitical entity, it has short-term and long-term goals which are influenced by its geography and by the geopolitics of the day. I was asked many questions in the interview, but I would like to focus on six of them. I made the point that the invasion of Ukraine had strengthened the case for Ukraine to join NATO. Look at Lithuania and Estonia. These are two Baltic states that share a border with Russia. They had joined NATO, they had joined NATO in order to forestall Russian aggression. Countries like Poland, like Estonia, like Latvia, like Lithuania, like Czech Republic, like Slovakia, all of them had joined NATO because they're terrified of the Russian bear. They regard Russia as an unpredictable, malevolent force, hell-bent on expansion and conquest. While this is a caricature and a stereotype, still, these fears are the main motivating force to join NATO. And Russia's invasion of the Ukraine gave all these countries the perfect excuse to say, you see, we told you so. Joining NATO is the only guarantee for our integrity and survival. And so Russia, ironically, had strengthened NATO. Germany is doubling its defense spending in a single month, from 53 billion to 100 billion, and had committed to invest more than 2.5 to 3% of GDP in its defense in the forthcoming years. Other countries of, of NATO had joined, had joined forces. The United States is moving units into NATO countries, including NATO countries that border Ukraine. Russia's ill-conceived, in my view, invasion and war in Ukraine did more to unify and cement NATO as a military alliance, albeit a defensive one, than any other event in the past 20 or 30 years. And so now, definitely, every country in Europe wants to join NATO. That includes countries like Georgia. Now, Ukraine has a right to go, to go Western. Ukraine has a right to choose the values of the West. Ukraine has a right to join the economic clubs of the West, such as the European Union. Ukraine is a sovereign country, but Ukraine has a neighbor. And exactly like individuals who have neighbors, 
you have to make compromises. You have to accommodate your neighbor, especially if your neighbor is much bigger than you and admittedly a bit aggressive. So Ukraine should be allowed to shape its culture, its society, its ethos, its way of life, lifestyle, and its values in any way it sees fit. But Ukraine cannot join a military alliance, a military, military alliance that claims to be defensive, but had been quite offensive in the past, for example, in Serbia. So Ukraine, it's not acceptable and not justified for Ukraine to join NATO. And Ukraine would do well to announce publicly that it is renouncing its bid to join NATO, pressing on with the European Union membership, but giving up on NATO as a military alliance on the doorstep of Russia. In the 1960s, when the USSR, the predecessor of the Russian Federation, had moved missiles into Cuba, the United States had reacted with a siege. It had reacted militarily almost. There was almost a third world war. And Cuba is much, much more distant from the borders of the United States than Ukraine is. Ukraine shares, Ukraine shares a border with Russia. There is also the issue of self-determination. They are clear ethnic Russian minorities, or at least Russian-speaking minorities, in the east of Ukraine. They are concentrated geographically there, almost nowhere else, only in the east of Ukraine. They want independence. They want autonomy. They want self-determination, the same way Kosovo had wanted in 1999, and the same way other countries um, had separated and seceded from bigger countries. So it may be unpalatable, it may be unacceptable to Ukraine, it may be painful. These areas are Ukrainian in, Ukraine, in Ukraine's eyes. But there are people there who don't feel Ukrainian. They feel Russian. And they border Russia. They have families in Russia. They speak Russian. Their culture is Russian. Everything there is Russian. There needs to be some accommodation of the political demands of these areas in the East. And the agreement signed in Minsk had not been implemented, not in small measure, because of Ukrainian obstruction. This needs to stop. Recognizing the independent republics of Luhansk and Donetsk in, in Ukraine is not the best solution. It provokes aggression on both sides. But something has to be done. Russia had invaded Ukraine with two strategic goals in mind. The first strategic goal was to create a corridor a land contiguity between Crimea and the Azov Sea, and to incorporate into this seaports like Odessa. So there's the uh, independent republics in the east, which are essentially Russian speaking and Russian ethnic. Then there is Crimea, which Russia had took from, had invaded and took from. Ukraine in 2014, and Russia now is trying to establish a contiguous land area, a buffer zone, a hinterland, connecting Crimea to the mainland, because right now Russia can reach Crimea only through a single bridge, that's a physical bridge, and they want to reach Crimea via land. Now, the campaign in the south and east of Ukraine had been exceedingly successful. Russia had moved inland 500 kilometers in less than a week. That's a sizable accomplishment in military terms. There, all strategic goals had been accomplished, perhaps with the exception of Mariupol and, and Odessa, which will fall 
probably shortly, into Russian hands. The South had been secured. Crimea is connected again to Europe. The second goal had been to change the regime in Kiev, regime change in Kiev. There, there was a miscalculation of heroic proportions, a defeat, actually, a military defeat. Russia had failed to take over Kiev, failed to disable Ukraine's military defenses, air defenses, for example. There's a whole convoy stalled at the outskirts of Kiev. So there's been a failure there. But does Russia really need to change the regime? The leadership, the Ukrainian leadership, had proven to be far more resilient than Putin and his inner circle had believed them to be. Far more resilient, far more independent, and far more savvy at manipulating world uh, public opinion. So maybe it's time to call this strategic goal off. Maybe it's time to say, okay, we're going to accept the Ukrainian leadership on condition that they renounce their aspirations to join NATO and that they accept the changes in borders that had been affected by the invasion. Whatever the bluster, whatever the public relations stance, the Ukrainian leadership is besieged, terrified, and is likely to be far more submissive and obedient to Russian demands. This perhaps is the best type of regime, best type of government that Russia could hope for. I don't believe the Ukrainian leadership would seek additional conflict with Russia. Should Russia truly engage in honest, genuine diplomacy to resolve the crisis, Russia probably would insist on ascertaining and securing its territorial um, gains in this war. It's not likely to give up many of the ter territories that it had taken over. It's not likely to give up on the two independent republics to the east. And it's definitely not likely to give up on a land bridge, land, a contiguous land bridge into Crimea. These things are forgotten. There's no way the Ukrainian leadership or the world can change this outcome. Better be realistic, realpolitik, and negotiate with Russia to freeze the situation as it is, as a first stage. But Russia should give up on this second goal, regime change, because if it doesn't, Ukraine is going to become a second Chechnya. There's going to be a war of attrition. Russia is going to be driven into war crimes, attacks on civilian population, massacres, and worse. Russia doesn't want to end up with a Syria on its border. It doesn't want to end up with a Chechnya which is dozens of times bigger than the original Chechnya, 44 to 48 million people. It doesn't want to create a refugee crisis, which backfires on Russia itself. Russia had taken 200,000 Ukrainian refugees, even more than Poland. So Russia has a vested interest to call it a day, to declare victory, and to negotiate with the much weakened Ukrainian leadership, a settlement, a settlement which will be long-lasting and guarantee the political and geopolitical interests of all the parties involved. It's today, needs to be done now, because Russia is sliding down the slippery slope into a war that it will not be able to win in the court of public opinion, even if it does win minor victories here and there. A war of attrition, guerrilla and asymmetric war. Now, the West had imposed sanctions of two types. One group of sanctions targets the Russian financial infrastructure. <clears throat> the Central Bank of Russia had been denied access to about one half of its foreign exchange reserves deposited with other central banks, mainly in the West. And many Russian banks, seven of them at this stage, had been excluded from the SWIFT international payment system. These are hard blows. The ruble had collapsed by 30 to 40 percent. The stock exchange in Russia is closed well into March 8th. Probably will remain closed afterwards. And if it does open, 
it will collapse spectacularly. The damages to the financial sector are massive. Foreigners are leaving Russia in droves, including foreign companies, including global brands. So foreign direct investment is collapsing. But there is very, there, there is very little the West can do that will really destroy the Russian economy. Russia's, Russia is a monoculture. Its main product is energy, gas, and oil. It sells $1 billion worth of gas and oil a day. That's a day. The doubling of energy product prices in the past 18 months has played into Russia's resilience and into its coffers. Russia is getting a hell of a lot more money for the same amount of, pro of production. So it's going to be impossible to isolate and subdue Russia financially. First of all, it still has access to about three to four hundred billion dollars in cash. Second thing, it, it is earning about a billion dollars a day. Moreover, OPEC members, which are ostensibly the allies of the West, had refused to collaborate with the West in imposing sanctions on Russia or in increasing their production of oil in order to mitigate the effects of Russia's isolation. OPEC Plus, which is the agreement between the 10 OPEC members and Russia, is still very much in force. Russia is the second largest producer of oil in the world after the United States and before Saudi Arabia. Russia is earning enough money daily to finance the vast majority of its uh, discretionary budget needs. So the financial sector is going to adapt, is going to reorient and redirect itself, and is going to become a lot more self-sufficient and self-contained with internal payment systems and integration into alternative non-Western payment systems. It's going to take something like six to 12 months but within a year, the Russian finance uh, arena will recover. So these sanctions are effective in inflicting short-term agony, but they are not a long-term solution because they don't alter the fundamental structure of the Russian economy. The second set of sanctions is imposed on oligarchs and Siloviki. Siloviki are security personnel ex-KGB, ex-FSB, ex-military in some cases, like Shoigu. So the Siloviki are security men. Siloviki means strong men, tough men. They are security men who surround Vladimir Putin and to a large extent isolate him from real information and real public opinion. So he is in an echo chamber with yes-men. These yes-men are the Siloviki. And so the, the new the new set of sanctions target the assets of the Siloviki, their yachts, their private jets, their ability to travel, uh, their family members. But the Siloviki are never going to betray or are not going to betray um, Putin. This is wishful thinking on the part of the West. It's been going on since 2012. The West and Western intelligence agencies believe that if you just touch the assets and the lifestyle of the Siloviki, they're going to turn around, they're going to depose Putin in a coup, or even assassinate him, as Senator Lindsey Graham uh, called to do two days ago. But the Siloviki owe their existence, let alone their wealth, to Vladimir Putin. He had created a highly well-oiled system of patronage and corruption, and they plug into it and they are the main engines of this machinery. And this machinery is awesome, and it's in control of every aspect, nook and, nook and cranny of Russia. There are other oligarchs which are not Siloviki. They're simply billionaires, rich people. And there are oligarchs who are technocrats. They run the government efficiently, and so on and so forth. But these people have very little influence. They can express discomfort or even concern at some moves of Vladimir Putin. Indeed, the business community in Russia was dead set 
against the invasion of Ukraine and had informed Putin as much days before the invasion. But as you see, it, it made no difference. It had a small effect. So targeting the ol oligarchs like Oleg David Paska, who, is, who went publicly against the war, who is anti-war, targeting people like David Paska or similar oligarchs, targeting technocrats, this would have zero impact on Putin. Targeting the Siloviki might have more impact on Putin had the sanctions been effective. But the Siloviki are masterminds at hiding their wealth. There's very little you can do to them. And when you have $13 billion or $24 billion, like some of the Siloviki, well, if you lose a billion here and there, that's small change. That's money for coffee. So even this set of sanctions, they're not effective. To summarize, I would say, there are no sanctions that could have long-term effect on the Russian economy because the West depends on Russian energy products. Any real, real painful sanctions imposed on Russia would hurt the West even more. If you destroy Russian banks, you have to pay depositors, which is what's happening in, in Austria right now. Austria has to pay $1.1 billion to depositors in the subsidiary of, of Sberbank, which is a Russian bank, uh, which had been which had gone bankrupt owing to the sanctions. So who's, who suffers? Austria suffers. The German depositors in Sberbank had suffered. Sberbank didn't. Similarly, um, if the West were to target oil and gas production and energy products, the West would go into recession. The impact would be in the trillions and it would be disproportional and asymmetric. The West would suffer much more than Russia. So this is off the table. There's no real way to touch the Russian economy, Russian wealth, which is concentrated in the hands of a few. And the fact that Russian oligarchs are integrated into the political and economic system of the West, especially, for example, in a country like the United Kingdom, they had bought their way into the power structures in Washington, in London, everywhere. It's impossible to effectively extricate them because by doing so, many, many dirty deals would be exposed. The political class and the economic elite in the West have a vested interest to keep the sanctions visibly spectacular, but effectively minimal. Now, what about the geopolitics of all this? The crisis in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, is an integral part and in the next stage in a realignment of superpowers. Throughout human history, the main superpowers were Eurasian. China had been a superpower when Europe had been, a, had been a swamp. Russia had been a superpower for a long period of time. The Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, the Middle Eastern empires. Eurasia down to the Middle East. This was the dominant part of the globe. The West is a new invention. The West had risen in the last 500 years. It's an aberration. There's been 9,500 years of Eurasian dominance and 500 years of Western dominance. And the West had become dominant because the West had resorted to violence and aggression on a scale unprecedented until that time. And the West had surplus population that it had exported in colonial enterprises. So the West's ruthlessness, callousness, recklessness, these guaranteed the West's dominance in geopolitical affairs. The West also developed science and technology, which had assisted in these adventures. But one must realize that the period of Western dominance is an aberration and in all likelihood transient. China is on the ascendance and it's going to drag Russia with it. Russia and China are going to become a single block, the Eurasian block. So now we are 
in a period of transition where certain power, superpowers are on the decline and other superpowers are rising to take back or to reclaim their historical positions of superiority. Now, the West is not going to take this lying down. And the conflicts we are seeing in the past 30 or 40 years have to do with these tectonic shifts, these movements of superpowers jostling for the number one and two slots. Superpowers are clashing, and they're clashing in the fault lines, they're clashing in the borderlands. Ukraine means borderland at the end, or cry at the end. Ukraine is a, is a fault line between Russia and Europe. And so we're going to see many such clashes in the fault lines, the South China Sea, Ukraine, the Middle East. These conflicts are part and parcel of a rearrangement of historical proportions uh, between East and West. Now, Russia, believe it or not, had gambled on the West. Piotr the Great, Peter the Great, at the beginning of the 18th century, tried to convert Russia into a Western country. His army was German. Russian aristocracy in the 19th century spoke French. The literature was heavily influenced by the West. Russia had gone Western with a minor break, which is the communist period. Russia resorted to its Western stance during the years of Yeltsin, the first president of independent, the independent Russian Federation. Even the communist regime was essentially Western. Communism was the brainchild of Karl Marx in London and Lenin in Germany. So Russia had gambled on the West for 300 years, starting with Peter the Great and ending with Yeltsin, putting himself in the first 10 years of his career, had gambled on the West. Putin had spent a long time in the West. He speaks German fluently. And so Putin believed in the West. He wanted to join the West. But then he changed course and orientation when the West contemptuously had ignored his perception of Russia as a superpower and his strategic national security demands some of which were very legitimate. And so the, the, the successive waves of expansion of NATO right into the borders of, of Russia, into Poland, into, into other countries, this rattled Putin. It woke him up. He realized and he understood that Russia would never be accepted by the West, except as a second tier regional power, to quote Barack Obama. Russia is at odds with the West, culturally, societally, historically, geographically, geopolitically, and Russia's dependency on the West is its worst feature. Putin is trying to win Russia off the West, not very successfully, may I add. For Putin to succeed in reorienting Russia, and reclaiming its heritage as an Eastern power and a bridge to the West, he must decouple from the West. He must impose on himself and on his country the very sanctions the West is threatening him with. He must reorient Russia's economy and financial system. He must block uh, Western access to many Russian assets. He must redefine Russian culture as mostly Eastern. Russia's gamble of 300 years had failed. Its dependency on the West had cost it dearly. It's time to say goodbye. This marriage is not working. It's time to divorce. Putin is real, has realized this. He's trying to reorient this gigantic battleship, Russia. Again, not very successfully because he had failed to diversify the economy of Russia. So Russia is heavily dependent on energy sales to the West and on the Western financial system. 
But this can be undone. There are other clients Russia could sell its energy to, and there are emerging alternative uh, financial infrastructure systems, non-Western ones. So he can plug into these financial, non-Western financial systems and let go and forego the Western financial system. It's going to take decades, and Putin is not going to witness the outcomes. But Russia is drifting away, and it's drifting away eastwards. It's very clear. The West has lost Russia. It could have had Russia. It could have owned Russia. It could have been a partner to Russia. So very easily. But the paranoia, yes, in the West, not in Russia. The paranoia in the West, the old Cold War mentality, and the instinct of competing rather than co-opting or cooperating. Hard, hard power rather than soft power. They undid any possibility of becoming one with Russia. There, were, there was even talk 15 years ago about Russia joining NATO. It's a great pity. It's a hugely missed opportunity and it spells the decline and even demise of, of the West, of Western civilization. The West is isolated, not the East. The vast majority of humanity lives in the East. The West is declining morally, it's decadent, its institutions are collapsing. We have seen the West's response to COVID, enough said. This is a colonial scramble. When superpowers rise and fall, when they jostle for positions, it creates a colonial scramble. There was a famous scramble for Africa in the 19th century. And in this scramble, some countries become colonies. Germany has a series of colonies. They are known collectively as the European Union. So some countries become colonies. Other countries become buffer zones. This is inevitable. Russia's war and invasion of Ukraine is part of this new colonialism. And there's a new wave of colonialism coming, Chinese colonialism, as we're going to see shortly, Russian colonialism, as we are witnessing. The West can either choose to join the scramble and convert other countries into colonies and buffer zones, and allies and vassal states, or it can stand back on ins and insist on a liberal international order. The liberal international order is dead in the water. Its might is right. It's Kissinger's realpolitik. If the West doesn't wake up to this new reality, it's doomed.